I cannot believe I have the honor today to podcast interview probably the most famous orthodontist in the world, Dr. Derek Mahoney. How are you doing, Derek? Good, thanks, Howard. How are you? I'm, I'm sorry that it's uh, 6 a.m. in the morning there, so you uh, just uh, early morning, but um, you're, you're an amazing man, Derek. You're a world-renowned specialist orthodontist who has spoken to thousands of practitioners about the benefits of interceptive orthodontic treatment. Early in your career, Dr. Mahoney learned from leading clinicians a dramatic effect functional appliance therapy can afford patients in orthodontic treatment. He has been combining the fixed and functional appliance approach ever since. His lectures are based on the positive impact such a combined treatment approach has had on his orthodontic results and the benefits this philosophy provides from a practice management viewpoint. After completing his dental degree at the University of Sydney, Dr. Mahoney proceeded to the United Kingdom where he completed his master's degree in orthodontics at the Eastman Dental Hospital Institute of Dental Surgery in London. Further studies led to the successful completion of a diploma in orthodontics at the Royal College of Surgeons, Edinburgh. Dr. Mahoney has also passed the Royal College of Dentists in Canada postgraduate examination in the field of orthodontics. Dr. Mahoney has also passed examinations leading to a postgraduate qualification in dental facial orthopedics from the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons in Glasgow. He has also maintained his membership in orthodontics qualifications from the Royal College of Surgeons England in Edinburgh. Dr. Mahoney has been seeing an average of 250 patients per week for the last two decades and has gained a vast amount of experience which he can pass on to clinicians so they can come to appreciate the key elements of his combined treatment approach. He currently has over 4,000 orthodontic patients in active treatment and has been a keynote speaker at the International Orthodontic Summit meetings, the International Association of Orthodontics meetings, the American Association of Functional Orthodontic meetings. He is considered by some to be the next leading lecturer on functional fixed orthodontics. Dr. Mahoney approaches his orthodontic diagnosis from a facial profile point of view. He sets his treatment goals to create not just straight teeth, but beautiful faces and healthy temporal mandibular joints. He is a visiting clinical professor at the City of London Dental School and is in charge of their international orthodontic program. Dr. Mahoney is a contributing editor of the Journal of Clinical Pediatric Dentistry, International Orthodontic Journal, and Journal of Dentofacial Orthopedics. I mean, I could read your CV for the entire hour. And by the way, I've uh, <coughs> I've lectured in um, Australia probably every five years for the last 20 years. Uh, my brother lives in Sydney. Last time I was in town, you were so nice and sweet to take me and my brother to dinner. I, I just think you're an amazing man. I, I want to start with this, this off-the-wall question, um, Derek, and that is, in the United States, if an orthodontist goes and teaches a general dentist anything about ortho, he's literally blackballed from his dental side. I mean, of the nine specialties, the endodontists want to teach you endo, and they assume you'll do the easy ones, and they'll do the hard the oral surgeons want you to pull all the easy ones. They assume you'll send them some thirds. But it seems like the, the, the link between orthodontics in America from the orthodontist is just a, a black hole of information. These, these kids walk out of dental school, and they've never done any ortho. So why do you think that um, – how did you cross that bridge? How did you come down from the mountain and decide that you would teach a low-life general dentist um, anything about orthodontics? Well – I, when I went through orthodontic school, was taught the same thing, uh, and that is um, don't get involved in teaching orthodontics to general practitioners. Uh, they don't know what they're doing. They'll do a short-term course. They're going to um, create problems. It's not good for the patient. You know, but what I found out, I guess, deep down, it really was a turf war based on monetary goals. And, um, uh, you know, uh, you're right. Uh, if you tackle a tough root canal and things go wrong, the endodontist is there to help you out. Um, if things go wrong, it's a general practitioner and you're doing some orthodontics. Wow, watch out. <laughs> it's, uh, everything comes down at once. But what I've, I think, proven in the model that I use and one of the reasons we're successful in private practice is um, I have an open book approach and I, I teach uh, as much as I, I can to general practitioner. Um, they take on board what they can utilize in their office. Um, and the bottom line is they end up becoming much better at diagnosing cases. 
So to me, it's a win-win situation. The more they know, uh, the more they're going to refer. Uh, there's so much work out there in orthodontics. I'm sure it's the same in the United States. Uh, here in Australia, we just don't have enough orthodontists to cover the territory. And every orthodontist that I know is, is busy, busy, busy. So um, I just feel um, what's happened in the last, I've been teaching for nearly 23 years. What's happened in the last five years has been this whole influx of what's called short-term orthodontics. You know, um, uh, six month braces, six month smiles, um, uh, clear correct, uh, Invisalign, um, a lot of things that make it easier for a general dentist now to, uh, to be able to do fixed appliance therapy. And do you think Invisalign and clear correct, do you think these are good things for the dental profession? For sure. And um, I think more and more general dentists are getting involved in what's called digital smile design, the ability to communicate to a patient and say, right, well, you're concerned by your anterior teeth, uh, you'd like to get them uh, straighter, but at the end of the day, gingival margin levels don't uh, match up, we've got to do some intrusion, some extrusion, we've got to create more for smile arc, more width. You know, you, you can't do good quality prosthodontics, um, uh, veneers, etc., unless you can do some minor tooth movement. So something like ClearCorrect, something like Invisalign, allows the general practitioner to use CAD CAM technology and be able to predict the movements quite accurately. So I think it's a wonderful uh, aspect uh, for treatment planning in cosmetic general dentistry, uh, let alone orthodontics. So Derek, you're talking to thousands of um, dentists right now. Most, 85% are in the U.S. Um, most of them are under 30. They're coming out of schools. They didn't. They had zero orthodontic training. Um, what would you? And, and they're sitting here, and they, they would love to learn some of this. What 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 pathway um, could you set for them? How, how can how they how can they go from zero to fifty miles an hour? Well, I think the first thing is diagnosis. Diagnosis is the key. And you know, I always say that I was never a good general dentist. You know, I think I did one root canal in my 30 years, and I created a few extra canals in the process. You know, um, I, uh, I I feel that um, clinically, what you do in orthodontics, you know, putting a bracket on, changing a wire, activating an appliance, it's very easy. Um, chair side. The skill, and I think what makes it difficult, is the diagnosis. So I think get on a program that doesn't push an appliance, doesn't push a technique, but just pushes pure diagnosis. A general dentist needs to be able to understand which cases not to touch. You know, uh, they need to be able to diagnose um, a class three jaw pattern in a child that's about to undergo uh, late mandibular growth. They need to be able to predict a, a patient who's going to have increased vertical facial proportions and, and not extrude molars in that case. Um, so uh, uh, diagnosis is number one. Number two then is simple fixed appliance therapy. There's so many courses now that work with um, CAD CAM that allow accurate bracket placement, positioning, you know. So I think that's the progression. Diagnosis, some simple fixed appliance therapy, and then, you know, as you get more experience, maybe tackling some of the more difficult cases. But there's always going to be the need for a specialist, as there is in every field of dentistry. There's always going to be the need uh, to have good communications with that specialist um, and say to that specialist, hey, help me with some of these simple cases, and I'm more than happy to refer the difficult cases to you. Yes. Um, how are you doing any of this education um, online? via the internet. If someone's listening to you in Tulsa, Oklahoma, how can they learn from the man if you're not going to be in Oklahoma? Yeah, and, and because I'm at the stage where I probably want to travel a lot less than I have, <laughs> is, um, uh, I put my entire uh, two-year program in orthodontics online. Uh, it's a website called adelogin.com. Uh, it's linked um, with a UK-based uh, university. Uh, and then what we do is we have my lectures, uh, we have literature references, uh, the doctors do multiple choice questions after do reading the papers that they're given to them. Uh, and then the goal is to be able to collect great records, uh, they help with their diagnostic skills, and then they've got to present 10 completed cases at the end of these uh, seminars, as well as either fly to London or to Sydney, Australia to do some clinical aspects. So I think we put together a pretty good package that's comprehensive. And, and again, it's not focused on one technique or one system because there is no ideal orthodontic bracket. There is no ideal aligner system. Uh, there is no ideal arch wire. I think you've got to learn how to do different techniques and use the correct techniques for the, the appropriate uh, case. 
Yeah, sometimes too simple is too simple. They're trying to make bonding agents just one bond. They're trying to make yeah. root canal files just one file, and it's sometimes too simple is too simple. So if um, I'm at adelogin.com, um, how much money is it? How many hours is it? Um, tell us more about uh, your online program. Yeah, so um, I'm not 100% sure on crossings. That's a split deal I do uh, with the web designers there. Um, but I know it can be done at your own pace, uh, meaning you start with module one, you complete that, uh, you, you sit the multiple choice exams, um, and then you move on to module two. And as a result, some people do it in super quick time, they do it full time. Some people do it, you know, most people who do it are in, busy in practice. And so they're allocating, say, one to two hours a day, uh, and it takes them uh, about a two year period to complete that. And the reason I say two years is because by the time they complete the 10 cases, it's at least that time, if not greater. So, you know, if, if we were going to um, start teaching someone endodontics, we'd start with, you know, a single canal incisor. Yeah. Um, yeah. What, what, talk about if someone was going to do their first few orthodontic cases, what would be entry level cases and then versus what would you stay away from and you don't want to touch that unless you're an orthodontist or been doing this for a decade? Yeah, um, good question. Simple cases would be class one crowding. There's no doubt about that. Basically, buckle segments aren't changed. It's really correcting anterior crowding problems. Then you move on to, say, the class two cases, particularly class two that have deep bite. Uh, and the younger the child, the easier they are to treat because um, the low angle cases, what we call brachycephalic class two, um, kind of um, self-correct as the child gets older because that mandible grows forward. The cases you want to stay away from are the high angle, what's called increased vertical cases. They uh, typically will have large open bites, they'll have long faces, um, you know, they're always difficult to treat even for the uh, orthodontist. The other case I think a general practitioner should stay away from unless he has a lot of experience is the class three jaw where the problem is the large mandible. I mean, we encourage in our program getting in early for kids who are class three mid-face deficient, who, whose problem is not a big mandible, but whose maxilla is underdeveloped, retronathic. They're easy cases to fix. You expand the upper jaw, you use reverse pull face mask therapy, and you get a good outcome. The cases that are very difficult are those where the mandible's a problem and the mandible's still growing. So you really have no end in sight, and no matter what you do, that mandible keeps growing. So class three uh, cases uh, with big mandibles, um, high angle vertical growers, uh, large open bites, um, you know, these are the cases I think a general practitioner should refer out. Do you, um I notice, um, you know, humans by their nature are kind of extremists. Everything's black, white, yes, no, up, down. I remember when I got out of school in 87, if you sent 100 kids to the orthodontist, 100 got their four first bicuspids pulled, and that yep. was ortho. And then it seemed like 20 years later, then there's a lot of general dentists who wouldn't even refer to an orthodontist who did any four bicuspids. I mean, it, the pendulum swung to the other way. Is there still a place for four bicuspid extraction? Yeah, I think there is, but here's the thing. When I went to orthodontic school, we would extract to re relieve crowding. I distinctly remember uh, we used to do a study model analysis. Any crowding greater than five millimeters, we'd take out four bicuspids. Yeah? We now realize that you can resolve crowding with newer techniques um, uh, on a non-extraction basis. So when I would extract, is not so much crowding, but when the face is full. Typical profile of a Chinese um, patient who's lip incompetent, has what we call bidental protrusion, which in the old days was called bimax. Um, you know, uh, those cases you need to extract because you need to retract the incisors to get a better lip seal. So I use the adage, nowadays I extract for the face. I don't need to extract for space. And that's the big paradigm shift in orthodontics. Whereas traditionally, I wouldn't look at the facial profile. I'd really just look at the study models. I'd see if I needed room and I'd work out how to get that room. Now with techniques like passive self ligation, um, earlier treatment with dentofacial orthopedics, um, we can make the room and not have to extract teeth. But if a patient has um, what we call a division three incisor relationship, where their upper and lower incisor teeth are proclined, it's very unstable to treat them non-extraction, and in fact, it worsens the profile. So in those cases, I would recommend extraction. And what was that rhyme again? Extract for face, not for space? Correct. Or extract yeah. for face, not for space. I, I love that. That 
I, uh, do, do you care if I uh, put that saying on a, your picture and uh, and make a meme out of it? Yeah. <laughs> it's actually something that the, the, the uh, Dr. Dwight Damon uh, uh, pushes a lot in his philosophy. And the way that I practice now has been heavily influenced by what he has done, uh, and that is to uh, teach specialists that, look, um, you know, when a child walks in, you look at their profile, and if, they, if their face is... Um, deficient, if they're flat lips, you don't want to extract, you want to support that profile, particularly as that patient ages. But conversely, if you have a patient who um, uh, is very full, uh, um, and, and, and an adage really, it might sound too simple, but it works, you, you do what, uh, what's called a soft tissue profile. So if you take a photo of the patient from side on, you draw a line from their soft tissue chin to their lower lip. By and large, if that line goes behind their nose, that's a non-extraction profile. If that line goes ahead of their nose, um, that would be someone I would probably consider extracting teeth in. And uh, yes, there's thousands of cephalometric analyses, but unfortunately, the downfall is they're all looking at hard tissue um, factors. Uh, you know, what patients look at is soft tissue. And uh, there's such a resurrection these days um, in dermal fillers, in Botox, in things that uh, help a patient look younger and more youthful. And I think the best way to keep someone's face looking younger and more youthful is to support their lip, improve their nasal label angle, and that really involves doing uh, non-extraction-based techniques. Um, Derek, I always felt, and, and tell me if you agree or disagree, I, I always felt that a uh, the reason so many adults needed orthognathic surgery is because so many of them, when they could have been intercepted, their general dentist didn't was had no orthodontic training. They didn't know what they were looking for, and basically, the general dentist, the family dentist, was asleep at the wheel um, between the ages like six and twelve. And then this girl shows up at twenty-one, and when she smiles, you know, it's all messed up. Do you believe that if general dentist if all the general dentists took your program and they all all knew the, 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 the mind part of the game, that there would be a lot more interception and a lot less orthognathic surgery? Yeah, absolutely. And, and this is the thing. Like, the term orthodontics really means tooth movement. But really, where you've got a problem that's a skeletal imbalance, you've got to do what's called dentofacial orthopedics. So orthopedics is bone changes, you know? So, you know, at the appropriate age, you can expand a maxilla. At the appropriate age, you can advance a mandible. At the appropriate age, you can advance uh, a maxilla. So, so really, the only cases that probably would still need orthognathic surgery are those class three um, high-angle, large mandible cases, because really no orthopedics is going to help those. In the old days, we tried chink up therapy, uh, all that did was to rotate the mandible backward. You can't stop a large mandible from getting larger. But certainly uh, in the uh, cases of patients who have maxillary deficiency, yeah, dentofacial orthopedics will reduce orthognathic surgery. And on top of that, we now have techniques um, combining uh, braces with what's called TADS or, or temporary anchorage devices. They also allow us to reduce the percentage chance of orthognathic surgery. And um when I got out of school in 87, um, everybody was afraid to refer to an orthodontist, oral surgeon, orthodontic surgery because there was so much paresthesias. And, and a lot of them in, back in the 80s, if you said to your patients, if you had to do it all over again, would you do it over again? And it was just 90% would just say, oh, my God, never, never. I can't feel. I, you know. um, how has orthodontic changed from the 80s to 2015? What, what, what percent of these people... Um, do you see now where they say, if I had to do it over again, I would not do it. It it it, it, uh, it made me numb. I, I wouldn't do it again. Versus how what percent say, oh man, that that was a great decision. I look better, feel better. Look, I I think orthodontic surgery has changed drastically, and the advent has been the small fixation screws. You know, when I was in dental school. Uh, um, the orthodontic cases used to leave the operating theater with halo frames around them, you know, and um, uh, and we had two-stage surgery, one-stage surgery um, to place these large bone plates, another surgery to remove them. Uh, nowadays, with these small titanium screws, uh, it's a one-surgery procedure, 
Um, it's like one, two days in hospital, recovery is quick. The chances of parish seizure, although they're still there, are greatly reduced. So I have a very positive feedback from the patients because the ones I send to orthopedic surgery really have major facial problems. And uh, when you see their facial balance improve, I mean, they are so happy. Also, the cases that I send to orthopedic surgery uh, are, are patients who suffer from really severe obstructive sleep apnea. Uh, those who can't cope with the CPAP. And, and, and I must say that more and more cases that I f diagnose with OSA are those who have the older style retractive orthodontics, you know. So rather than develop the upper jaw, bring it forward, they had teeth out and the upper jaw was pulled back. So now they have no room for their tongue uh, and they have a lot more TMJ problems, they have a lot more airway problems, etc. So unfortunately, those that we missed the both for uh, in dental fascia orthopedics are those that go to the uh, orthonathic surgeon for what we call a BIMAX advancement procedure to improve their airway. But, but it's chalk and cheese compared to what uh, I saw 30 years ago uh, in orthonathic surgery to what I see now. Uh, it's much simpler surgery, uh, the advent of um, newer surgical techniques, the advent of um, semi-rigid fixation uh, has really made it um, a, a procedure for patients where they recover quickly uh, and their chance of the problems you said uh, are, are greatly reduced. Do, do you know, have any percentages or anything about what percent of obstructive sleep apnea could be correct orthodontically or orthognathic surgery? I mean, is, is this yeah. a rare or common well, or? Well, depending on who you read, you know, up to 70% uh, is some of the, the figures that they're, they're quoting. I guess what I'm saying is a general dentist needs to be on the ball with uh, something like a CBCT. I mean, CBC technology is such that you can look at 3D airway, but the general dentist needs to ask the right questions to uh, parents uh, and their kids. You know, does your child snore? Does your child wet the bed? Um, um, uh, you know, uh, what's your child's sleep cycle like? And I think one of the big epidemics in America is um, so many kids being just randomly diagnosed with attention deficit disorder without a sleep study. I mean, there's been landmark research to show that many children who were incorrectly diagnosed with ADHD put on medication that actually disrupts their sleep. Um, were those who had what's called sleep disordered breathing. And what it uh, involved was either removal of tonsils and adenoids, if they were the cause, what it involved was uh, arch expansion. Uh, and all these things actually improve their airway uh, because the young child that you don't treat uh, dentofacial orthopedically for mid-face deficiency is going to be a future apnea patient. There's no doubt about that. How, how much of your curriculum these days involves um, sleep apnea? A huge, a huge amount, and, and every year we add more and more modules because to me, you know, in the days of John Witzig, if you'd remember, you know, it was all about facial profile, it was all about don't take teeth out because you're going to age the patient, uh, don't take teeth out because you're going to put pressure on the jaw joint, you know, and, and some of those things are true, but I think the bigger thing is um, get in early to uh, improve the child's airway. We as general dentists are actually gatekeepers of the kid's airway. We're looking at the kid's mouth a lot more thoroughly than their general physician would. You know, so I say to my uh, students, look, don't just look at the teeth. Uh, push the tongue down, look at the back of the throat. Uh, look at the size of the tonsils, you know. Um, uh, ask the patient um, to say, ah, see if the soft palate elevates. If it doesn't, maybe the adenoids are increased, you know. You can hear these kids, you know, rather than say banana. They, they said banana, you know. Um, you ask the parent uh, to take a photo of their child while, while they're sleeping and you see these kids have these weird posture like with their, with their mouth open, with their head back like that. You know, th th these are the kids that uh, uh, really need a combined approach with the general dentist who does dentofacial orthopedics, with the respiratory physician and most importantly with the enos and throat doctor. And what age are you starting to intervene on these children? Is this, you know, f five, six, twelve? Yeah. What, what absolutely. Age? I mean, when it comes to airway, the earlier the better. Absolutely. I mean, we have some kids uh, who have such severe obstructive sleep apnea, even as babies, right? Um, but uh, what, what, what? This is this is the thing that we know, and the medical profession knows that large adenoids and tonsils will naturally shrink in most kids by age 12. But the problem is, 90% of facial growth is finished by age 10. 
So if you have a child who has large adenoids and tonsils, not infected, but just large, and it's affecting their sleep, it's affecting um, their, their breathing, um, it's actually also affecting their facial development. And I think one of the big things that we're looking at now uh, is to um, uh, take a CBCT, do a 3D measurement of the airway, ask the right questions uh, as far as um, the child's sleep is concerned, and then institute the appropriate therapy. Is there any um, CBCT brand name that you like or prefer that's easier for everything that you do? Yeah, 100%. I mean, the market leaders are, are ICAT. Uh, they've come up with technology in their new flex machines where one head CBCT is less radiation exposure than one panoramic uh, radiograph, which is amazing. So why would you expose a kid to a panoramic radiograph that only gives you two-dimensional data when you can do a whole 3D scan, use that for cephalometric analysis, use that to check the airway. Uh, and there's many orthodontists who, who lecture specifically for that company who, who like me, are passionate on, on looking at kids' airway. Um, uh, you know, Juan Quintero is one who's out of Florida. If anyone hasn't listened to that guy speak, it, it's an absolute must because What's he his looks, name? Um, his name is Juan uh, Quintero. Uh, and um, uh, he's an orthodontist in, in um, uh, if I'm not wrong, sort of Miami, Florida. And he does a lot of lecturing uh, on early screening, early diagnosis using this uh, new technology. And it's truly amazing because he, again, is focusing on the kids. He's again focusing on the airway. That's the important issues. So you're, so you're um, exclusively using the iCat then? Correct, yeah. And th is, that a, uh, is that a Danaher product? It is. It is. Um, and they're they're probably the largest uh, dental company in the world, aren't they? I mean, I think. I think I think them and Henry Schein take it in turns to, <laughs> to one get larger than the other. And and you know what it's like. These companies now acquire laterally. You know, um, Danaher has a market share in Cybron, uh, in Ormco. Uh, you know, uh, Noble Biocare implants now, et cetera, et cetera. So these are just massive conglomerate companies. But I guess the benefit there is there's a lot of interaction between their sales reps. And one of the big interactions with Ormco in the orthodontic market is, is with ICAT and the technology associated with that. You know, one of the litmus tests in economics is that, you know, when you come out with a new product, it should solve a problem faster, easier, higher in quality, but lower in cost. It seems like when it went from fixed braces uh, to uh, um, removables like Invisalign, um, yeah. they, they didn't get that lower cost thing. It was actually a $1,000 penalty to do that more. But now some people are saying uh, the patents are expiring, that there's going to be more competitors. Do you, do you think someday soon the price of uh, um, an Invisalign-like product will be the same cost as traditional hard wire, or do you think it's just inherently a higher cost way to do ortho? Oh, no, no, no. De definitely. Um, I mean, Invisalign have had, and I take my hat off to Invisalign, they've done magnificent marketing directly to the public, which is putting patients in the operatory of, of dentists and, and orthodontists around the world. But unfortunately, their patent does end and uh, it, it, it ends next year. So what's going to happen, you will have a conglomerate of companies using CAD CAM technology, using uh, orthodontic softwares uh, to reset the teeth to make it quite already uh, other than clear uh, uh, correct. Uh, uh, Ormco uh, have, have a product which again um, uses um, uh, CAD CAM technology, uses a software that resets the teeth and then from that uh, produces um, a series of aligners. So, you know, whether you want to call it red, white and blue, magic aligner, I mean, there's, uh, there's so many companies on the market. But here's the thing. I think with any of the bigger companies, what tends to happen is they make the the whole aligners in one go, you know, so if you have a complex case, you might need 35 aligners, you know, and, and things start going off the track around about aligner 10 or 11, either compliance based or the fact that you haven't done enough stripping or you haven't done the stripping in the right position. I think the future lies in technology where the patient is given a set of six aligners, they're then rescanned for accuracy and another six. And then what makes it easier nowadays is uh, intraoral scanners. 
Um, you know, back in the day when I started doing Invisalign, you know, I had to learn how to do a PVS impression because as an orthodontist, that's not a, a normal thing we did. Now it's so simple, you know, uh, uh, the scanners on the market, you can do an upper lower scan in, in under three minutes and there's no gagging. And that technology goes straight to the lab you're working with to reset the teeth. So, so that's the future in orthodontics. It really is the holy grail. And what scanner are you using? You're using an ICAP uh, for a CBCT, but what scanner? Uh, to, to me, the number one scanner in the market uh, is by Three Shape, uh, and um, uh, uh, it's um, uh, a, a scanner that, that that works very quickly. But it's also the most expensive. I think there's a lot of mid-range scanners on the market. I mean, um, there's a, a, a scanner called Lithos, uh, which I, I started with, which is great. I think what a general person needs to understand is. If you're going to get into intraoral scanning, make sure you get a or work with a company that gives you an open file, an STL, because then you can share that data for your crown and bridge. You can share that data for your aligners, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And unfortunately, I think when the first scanners came on the market, they were linked with certain products like um, Invisalign, I think, had the... Um, um, uh, I'm not sure the, 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 the name of the company, um, but... Uh, uh, it, it, it was a scanner specifically just for Invisalign, and you can only use it for that. Nowadays, with these open files, um, you can scan for a number of, pro uh, of properties. And so, uh, for instance, I get all my lab work done in the United States, even though I'm here in Australia. So after I've scanned um, uh, a case, literally one minute later, the lab is printing out the 3D um, the custom model and fabricating the appliance. I mean, it's, it's, it's really amazing to see what these labs can do nowadays. So what, so what lab are you using in the United States? Uh, I use um, uh, Alessi Orthodontic Appliances, AOA, uh, and I use uh, Lab in Canada. Uh, AOA.com? Yeah, yeah, I'm pretty sure they're called AOALab.com. They're, again, a subsidiary of Ormco, uh, and, and um, they, they make a number of appliances, including clear aligners, um, very accurately and and a very good cost. Oh, aoaaccess.com. That's it. Access is their portal. Uh, okay. So I, uh, access is the, the the ability for you to upload the uh, the 3D file to design the appliance and to interact with the technician on the other side. Yeah. And that's owned by Ormco. Yeah, correct. Yeah. Which is owned by Kerr, which is owned by Danaher. Is that right? Exactly. Exactly. Or Ormco Danaher. Uh, or Ormco Kerr Danaher. So they'll make um, all your aligners at that at that lab, AOA access. AOA uh, access. Yeah, not all the aligners. If I, if I have a simple case where I need for six aligners to maybe finish. Uh, a kid, I had to pull the braces off early because the oral hygiene wasn't good. You know, the, the bride-to-be that needs their braces off in time. You know, so I do a lot of case finishing with their aligners. But, but for the complex cases, I, I love Clear Correct. I think the technology is as good as Invisalign, uh, but their cost is like 35% cheaper. So, um, uh, so but and again, I mean, you need to shop around. And, and, and Clear and, Connect's out of uh, Dallas, Texas, is it? Uh, uh, they're, they're now, they started in Dallas. Now uh, they're still in Texas, but um, it's something rock. I, I'm, I was going to say. Uh, now wasn't wasn't the founder of ClearCorrect? Wasn't um, he also the founder of Invisalign? Is that is one that of the founders? Right? Exactly. I mean, uh, I mean, the the history goes that um, uh, um, when that uh, uh, company first launched, it was launched by a general practitioner. Who was, who was left with like 200 cases he couldn't finish because the previous company he was using was successfully sued by Align Technology and had to be shut down. So he was this guy who was <laughs> mid-treatment with all these cases and wanted to finish them but uh, wasn't, wasn't allowed to basically. And so, you know, lawsuit after lawsuit, uh, he decided, look, I'm gonna set up my own company. He got the guy who set up Invisalign to begin with, who was also upset, uh, and they worked together and they set up Clear Correct, and then the rest is history. They've launched, they've now launched in Canada. Very successful uh, model. Huh, that is amazing. Um, would you say that, okay, so you call things like Invisalign Clear Correct, you call those aligners, that'd be the generic term? Correct. And, yeah. and, and versus what? Fixed ortho? Is it fixed yeah. ortho versus aligners? Yeah. So I would say, so I said to my patients, you can have clear aligners. Uh, you can have invisible braces. Now, by that, I mean lingual technology, which again is 3D customized. Um, or you can have 
uh, uh, braces on the outside, which may or may not be visible nowadays. You have self-ligating uh, ceramic brackets, which you know, which are, 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 are very aesthetic, um, and they all get the job done. Uh, but it's got to the stage now where the predictability of aligners and the predictability of lingual is as good as labial. So, you know, more and more my patients are going for that technology. What, what do you say to the old guys like me that are, you know, 50 to 70 that back in the day when lingual came out, everybody came in with a chewed up hamburger tongue? Do you think yeah. linguals are making a comeback? Are they, are, is the tongue playing with them less and not getting chewed up like it was in the 80s? Yeah, well, with lingual now, the, the 3D custom bracket has such a low profile and it does zero effect on speech. I mean, I have patients who within a day uh, are back to jobs such as uh, lawyers uh, or TV newsreaders and it doesn't affect their speech, you know. So back in the day when Craven Kurtz was developing the lingual technology with Ormco, the, the Series 7 bracket, which was the latest bracket back then, it's um, meso distal uh, dimensions and its labial lingual dimensions were nearly four times the current bracket size, just to give you an idea. Uh, so uh, absolutely, um, uh, you can't, people who knock lingual used to knock it because uh, it was hard work wire bending, it was um, bulky for the patient, it, it affected their tongue and their speech. Those days are gone, you know, um, and I always say, you know, get behind the science, you know, get behind the tooth. That's the new lingual catch cry nowadays. Get behind the science, get behind the tooth. Yeah, yeah. I love your catchphrases. Um, so, Derek, what, um, what are the red flags for when you treat a patient and say, no, I want Derek to be in charge of this. I, I want fix. I, I want to take all the variables out of your hand. I'm worried that you're not um, compliant. So maybe it's more a boy or a girl or a boy that hadn't combed his hair and he comes in and he's not um, cleaned up. What, what red flags do you look for when you say, oh, I trust the patient to wear aligners clear aligners versus you're looking at this patient and you're saying no i want i want it all control you, you know that's a, a really hard thing to pick you know you, you you'd say in the past look, look at the kid if he's if he's shabby in his dress sense and he's you know he's always the kid who's losing his glasses and things like that but, but some of those kids become your best compliers i think it's uh it, it's it's really trying to get down to the level of the child I mean, there's no doubt in my mind that female patients are a lot more compliant than males, particularly at that teenage years. There's no doubt about that, right? <laughs> but, yeah, uh, I always say, you know, girls mature three to four years ahead of guys at that age, if guys mature at all at that age, right? Um, uh, uh, so, so, I mean, that would be one of the predictors, but I always give the patient the first chance, you know, I say, right, well, you, you know, you don't want braces, we can do this with aligners, but if you don't wear the aligners, it ain't gonna work, right? And nowadays, there's more and more compliance indicators. You know, with a lot of my retainers nowadays, we have a compliance indicator chip we put in the retainer. So that means when the kid comes in for the retainer check, I can scan it and I can tell how many hours the kid's been wearing it. And Are the kid you serious? Knows, yeah, and the kid knowing that, uh, becomes a better complier, right? Uh, it's uh, so. Oh yeah, they say they say if you put a security camera over a cash register, stealing from right. the cash register plummets. But tell more about when, when did a chip come out that you could put in a liner? It, this came out about three years ago, and again um, came out um, because of the um, OSA market, right? So so here were uh, uh, companies that realized that oral appliances were sometimes as effective as CPAP for the mild to moderate cases but a lot of the physicians were saying well the good thing about CPAP with the card reader we can tell how often the guys used it and what his sleep was like when he didn't didn't use it um, and so what we've done now with oral appliances uh, there's a microchip that goes in the uh, acrylic uh, so that you can see how often the patient wore that so then that technology then led to, well, obviously, what's the biggest compliance issue around the world? It's kids after braces not wearing their retainers. So putting these compliance chips in there has, has made a huge difference uh, in that regard. Wow. That is, is there just one company doing that, or is there more than one? Or Well, the, the main one is, is uh, um, I'm trying to think of the name. They're out of Germany. I think Braybond, I can get back to you with the exact details. But it's a really simple system. You, you literally just buy a little uh, scanner. Um, you you uh, you work with your lab, and uh, the lab buys the the little um, chip directly. They embed it in their acrylic, 
uh, and then away you go. So when the kid comes in, you just uh, get that retainer, give it a scan, and you can check the hours of wear. It's, it's really that simple. What was the other lab? You, you were talking about um, AOA Access. What was the right. other uh, lab you were talking about? Uh, the other lab is ProTech. Uh, they're they're Pro out of Van yeah, Vancouver in Canada. They're one of the market leaders in 3D technology. Um, and again, you know, when it comes to, uh, I make some appliances with AOA, uh, mainly my, my fixed functionals, my Maras, my Herps, uh, that sort of thing. Um, but we're, we're removable appliances, twin blocks, um, retainers, uh, you know, I, uh, Protect does a fantastic job. And do either of those labs do um, just traditional crown and bridge too, if you had the oral scanner and all that? Yeah, not uh, not AOA. They're they're dedicated for orthodontics, uh, but Protec is a full service lab. So again, they're doing milling technology that just you know, I, I'm not a general dentist, but I'm amazed at how they make these zirconia um, uh, crowns um, using CAD CAM technology, and then the crown is made 30% bigger, and then it just shrinks to this perfect vacuum. And I mean, the, that technology just you know blows your head away. I mean, I. I make it my pilgrimage every two years to go to Cologne to the biggest dental show in the world, you know, the IDS. And that's the show place for German technology. Um, and every time I go, I see it's becoming more and more automated. And, 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 that's, and I think we as orthodontists have lagged behind you as general dentists when it comes to CAD CAM technology. Uh, you know, you guys had the CEREC machines and all that years ahead. We're just slowly catching up with things like Sure Smile, um, you know, uh, the, the newer uh, lingual braces um, uh, that are 3D customized. Uh, you know, Insignia is another product uh, where uh, the, 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 the brackets are cast um, specific for the patient's malocclusion. The wires are bent by a robot. The, the brackets are put on with indirect bonding. It's, it's truly amazing. So, Derek, is it overly simplistic for me to ask you, like, well, what if you just had, if all your patients were just adults, what yeah. percent would be um, clear aligners versus lingual braces versus fixed appliance? Do you? Yeah, li literally with adults, um, I would say more than 80% would be clear aligners and lingual. Uh, Twenty percent are labelled just simply because at their age they just you know don't want to go through that whole experience uh, that they went through as teenagers. Most of the adults are relapse cases, you know, um, uh, and uh, and in the past I used to balk at offering align technology, aligner type technology or lingual because I knew my case finishing would be really difficult. Now, you know, the, the case finishes are as good as labial, so why not give the patient what they want? That's a huge market builder. I think there's two things that precludes adults from orthodontics, and it's not cost. Everyone thinks it's cost. It's absolutely not cost. It's time in braces uh, uh, and the convenience factor of how many visits they have to come in, and the second is aesthetics. You know, they really just want something that uh, is not visible. That's why uh, Align Technology has done so well. If you look at uh, their figures in profit, um, they uh, profit last year was was bigger than the two big orthodontic companies combined, which is Ormco and Unitech, which shows you there's a huge demand for aligners. So Ormco and Unitech combined didn't make as much as uh, Invisalign. Correct. Yeah. Wow. So um, so these lingual braces, um, I mean, are you doing a lot more of them in 2015 than you were in 2010? I mean, is this a relatively new hot explosive growth part? Lingual braces. Yeah, uh, because there was a guy um, out of Germany, an orthodontist, uh, Dirk Wischmann, uh, who developed a, a technique uh, known as incognito. Um, and it was the first technique where everything was automated uh, and German precision, and you really got the end results. And that opened this whole market in lingual. Nowadays, the top lingual braces would be braces that are self-ligating, so they're easy for the clinician to change the wires. They're very low in profile, so they're comfortable for the patient, and they're very, very accurate because of the fact um, that just like aligners, um, uh, they, they work from the end product backwards. You know, So uh, uh, you do an intraoral scan, uh, the teeth are reset into an ideal occlusion. From that ideal occlusion, the brackets are manufactured and then put back on the original malocclusion model. And then the wires are customized first, second, third order bends. Uh, and I mean, that, that technology is now available in three or four systems. Um, but the market leader has been Incognito, which eventually was bought by 3M Unitech now. 
um, uh, and uh, is still, I think, one of the most popular lingual braces. You know, um, one of the things about air travel, since you and I have traveled to way too many cities for way too many decades, <laughs> uh, I got to leave the bar to Calgary, then New York, then Tennessee, uh, but it seems like the planes get nicer, 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 but they still only play, fly 500 miles an hour. You know, they haven't really got any faster. I mean, uh, from me to visit you and my brother in Sydney, I mean, that, that's still a 60 hour flight. Is braces the same way? I mean, are braces getting any faster? I mean, do you see braces from 20 years ago to today? Is the length of time in braces shortening any, or is it kind of an airplane where it'll get nicer, but it's not going to go any faster? Oh, no, no. I, I think that it's not the braces that are becoming uh, uh, smarter in any way to reduce time. It's the technology of tooth movement. So the two biggies on the market now um, a vibration, micro -vi vibration um, uh, uh, that speeds up tooth movement. And the other thing is, is, is a company called Propel. And um, what Propel is, it's, it's doing uh, a micro perforation near the tooth you want to move a bit quicker, uh, which takes advantage of a phenomenon known as rapid accelerating phenomenon, RAP effect. And that RAP effect releases more cytokines. And we know that cytokines are uh, are really important for tooth movement. So regardless of which brace you use, so if I offer a patient clear aligners, or lingual, or labial, I also add, I also offer them uh, an ability to speed up the treatment. And that um, with aligners, um, I like using a product called Accelident, uh, 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 which allows me to change my aligners a lot quicker than the average 10 days. With braces, labial or lingual, I like using a product called Propel. And those two have been shown in clinical studies to speed tooth movement up to like 37 to 40 percent. Uh, and uh, so I can say to an adult, look, uh, I can get you out of braces maybe six months to nine months sooner if you're willing to undergo um, you know, these techniques. And of course, adults jump at that. There's no, there's no doubt about that. So it's not the braces that have got more intelligent uh, and quicker um, uh, like Concord did back in the day. And, you know, you're talking about flights to Sydney. You know, I, I know there's problems with Concord, but wow, that was well out of its time <laughs> in doing long haul flights, right? Um, uh, but to me, it's not the brace so much these days that's speeding up the treatment. It's the ability to use added technologies um, such as micro perforations, such as uh, vibration, nowadays even ultrasound, uh, to speed up the biology of tooth movement. Wow. Now, do you know the uh, CEOs of uh, Propel and Accelident? Look, I don't, I don't, I don't but uh, the, the, both those companies are based in the U.S. Um, both have really good uh, literature to support what they do. Propel, all the studies came out of NYU, uh, Accelident um, uh, uh, out of Texas um, uh, as far as the, the initial trials, and, and both have shown promising results. And again, if you look at Accelident, the compliance indicator chip that's in there, again, allows me to check whether the patient has used it. It's like 20 minutes a day, but for some patients, that's a hard call. Now they've got their new model, which is waterproof. So the patients can kind of use in the shower every morning. I can then check how many times they've done that. And absolutely, I've seen a, a huge improvement in the way teeth move because of that. That is truly amazing. And how much extra do you have to charge for your ortho case uh, to use uh, these new technologies, Propel and Accelident? Look, the magic figure, no matter what technology comes out, seems to be about 1,000 US dollars. That seems to be the cost uh, uh, to the consumer and the cost of the orthodontist is a little bit less than that. But, you know, if a patient get out of their treatment nine months sooner, they're quite willing to pay that extra premium for $1,000. It's a bit like, you know, people flew Concorde knowing it was like five, six times the cost, uh, but it got there a lot quicker. What, what do you think of all these general dentists uh, around the world um their introductory to ortho is like a short-term ortho course, um, mm -hmm. you know, and not a full curriculum. Do you, do you think that's a bad idea? Do you, do you think it'd be smarter to learn, you know, a two-year curriculum first before you start playing with short-term? Or do you think short-term is a good introduction to learning ortho? 
Look, I think short term is a great introduction provided someone is helping that dentist who has zero experience with diagnosis in picking the right case. So if you're doing anterior cosmetic alignment and not really disrupting the buccal segment, short term ortho is great, right? But if you have a case that has a, a class two, a class three, a deep bite, an open bite, and you're doing more than just anterior alignment, then definitely I think the longer haul courses are the way to go. Um, but uh, uh, I guess it's a hard mindset for a general dentist who's done no ortho to then have a two-year commit to incorporate ortho into in their practice, where it's kind of like alluring to do a weekend course um, on one of these um, uh, short-term ortho uh, uh, and then kind of try one or two simple cases, get the confidence level, and then if you like it and you see it's a good mix for your practice, progress on to the more complex cases. So I think there's a market for both. What I'm saying is, I don't think a general dentist can say, yeah, I do orthodontics in my office, if all he does is short-term ortho. Um, do you, um, have you noticed that when you go around the world um, that some countries, like in the United States and the Middle East, like their teeth really white and really straight, and then in some other countries, kind of the people kind of think that looks kind of goofy, almost like you look like a clown. Do you yeah. see, do you see more ortho in some cultures uh, versus other, and does ortho also seem to be correlated with super Clorox bleach white teeth? You think there's a connection there? Yeah, definitely. I think when my patients finish orthodontics and have straight teeth, the next thing they want is white teeth. There's no doubt about that. And some of my teenage patients, their expectations of white is like the porcelain in the toilet bowl. You know, it's it's really what you and like, you know that. I mean, Vito has come out with new shade guides specifically for this whitening market, right? Um, mm. and, and you're right. I mean, I did my training in the UK. Uh, and let me tell you, if you look at horrible teeth, you always associate England with that, don't you? I mean, you look at some of the uh, English actors, you think they would never make it in Hollywood just on their teeth, let alone anything else, right? I mean, that culture is slowly changing, but when it comes to, um, you know, in Australia, we kind of follow more the American market. You know, people want that Hollywood smile. There's no doubt about that. Uh, and America is still the big market for um, straight teeth, white teeth. Um, but that's slowly changing. I mean, again, the internet, uh, travel, uh, uh, access to information, people realizing that um, straight teeth is not just about the it looks, it's about better hygiene, uh, it's about uh, better wear on the teeth, uh, uh, et cetera. And I think one of the biggest things we look at now is the impact on proper vertical dimension um, uh, when it comes to aging, right? And if you can get in early and do some orthodontics, not just to make the teeth look better, uh, but, but to improve the facial balance, um, definitely that patient's gonna age more gracefully. So I think that's becoming a, a, a big market. And even in the UK, I mean, I, I, my alumni is in London, I, I, I teach um, in the UK a lot. Uh, I see that slowly changing where the younger generation absolutely want to um, have uh, straight teeth, whereas uh, back in the, the days of the National Health Service, you know, 30 years ago, um, <clears throat> you know, you, you, it, it, it's uh, the really severe class twos were the only ones that had treatment. Um, nowadays, uh, more and more people have access to that. Um, Derek, I, I've also noticed, I wonder if you believe this true or false, but when I go around the country, it seems like the dentist that get into cosmetic, whether it be bleaching, tooth color fillings, veneers, or ortho, short-term ortho, full ortho, it seems like when they walk the talk by doing it to themselves, their assistants, their hygienists, it really takes off in the office. It's almost like the, the culture brand is the whole office. But I still see so many dentists trying to sell bleaching, bonding veneers, and their own teeth are crooked and they're crowded. They're dental assistant looks like she could eat corn on the cob through a chain link fence. <laughs> and then I meet guys like you, and I mean, you're, you're gorgeous, you're polished, your teeth are perfect. Do you think to your listeners out there that, you know, you, you couldn't be an aerobics uh, instructor if you weighed 300 pounds and had a cigar in your hand, that maybe one of the first persons that should get ortho bleaching bonding is the dentist themselves and their staff? Yeah, 100%. I mean, you know, when I employ my front desk staff, the first thing I look at is their teeth because, you know, I'm, I'm here trying to uh, um, uh, convince an adult or convince a, a, a parent that their kid would benefit from orthodontics. And if I have horrible teeth, you know, I, I really can't um, 
uh, justify the, the you know, and I had um, really bad orthodontics as a kid, you know, so I retreated myself with braces when I was an orthodontist. And let me tell you, my productivity that year when I had braces on was, was 30% over and above, and I could never figure it out, and then it finally clicked. People were walking out and saying, look, I know Dr. Moni has braces. I didn't realize you could get braces as an adult. Uh, not only do I want a console, but I want the braces he's using because clearly he knows what he's doing, right? Um, uh, and same thing when it comes to uh, front desk staff. Uh, you know, we insist that those girls have nice teeth um, um, and, and white teeth because that's, that's what we're, we're, we're selling at the end of the day. Um, so uh, if a general dentist is doing, I mean, you know, what's funny how it, Every general dentist calls themselves a cosmetic dentist. I mean, where, where is the non-cosmetic general dentist? There isn't one, okay? Um, but the thing is, um, they need to have a good look in the mirror themselves if they're trying to sell veneers, if they're trying to sell whitening, and they have like these horrible teeth. Because again, uh, technology is available where, uh, where they can get simple treatment. And um, I always believe that no one should be, uh, become a midwife unless they've had a kid themselves, right? In uh, the same thing, before you start doing orthodontics, go through the experience yourself and you're going to relate to the patients much easier. Yeah, I, I agree. And it seems like all the people who are crushing it in ortho and cosmetics and all that, they, they all walk the talk. They, they all do it themselves. Uh, I, that was the first thing I noticed on you when we met for dinner. I mean, you, you, have, you have a million dollar smile. Um, I'm just about out of time and uh, I can't believe you got up at six o'clock in the morning to meet me. Um, Dentaltown has 205,000 members from all over the world. Um, I wish you would put some of those ortho courses on Dentaltown. I think uh, um, e even if it was just a, a teaser section for each one, it might be a good marketing thing to lead them back to your, your other site. Um, sure. And one of, the re one of the big pet peeves I have for um, really wanting general dentists around the world um, to listen to this and, and on my podcast, every single country that iTunes matches downloads every single episode on these podcasts that if they, if they don't understand the knowledge and they're asleep behind the wheel from this child from age, you know, six to 12, then, then, then they, you know, so many things could be prevented. And, uh, I, I just, I just wish that, um, I just wish that general dentist, um, just really knew how to diagnose and treatment plan, especially in the critical interceptive ages between six and ten and then the and then the other reason i love orthodontic osmosis i've noticed that with humans uh um in america you're either all in or you're out like like you've never gone bowling for five years or you own your own bowling ball you haven't been to the lake once in 10 years or you own your own boat and it seems like everybody that gets their teeth straightened and bleaching they start brushing and flossing and coming in every six months it's like it's like their mind gets turned on to their mouth and if they look in the mirror and they don't like what they see, they don't pay any attention to it. And then yep. that turns into gum disease and decay and, and oral systemic health issues. And I think what every American needs is to look in the mirror and fall in love with their teeth and their smile. And if that means they have to be straighter with indirect, direct, labial, lingual, I don't even care. I just want humans to fall in love with their mouth because they'll only take care of things they like. Yeah, I totally agree with you. That that's absolutely well said. So, uh, so I uh, I applaud you for having the guts to talk to low life people like me. I can't believe I'm <laughs> uh, I'm talking to an orthodontist uh, as a low life general dentist. I um, uh, you've lectured in gosh every, every country I, I can think of. I've seen your name there at all the major meetings. Um, you're absolutely. I I think you're the number one most sought after speaker in orthodontics. You're an amazing man. I sure had fun having dinner with you and my brother. Uh, but um, thank you, Derek, so much for all that you do for dentistry all around the world. Thank you, Howard, and I look forward to catching up again when you come and visit your brother. All righty. Okay. Thanks a lot. Have a great day, and tell your lovely wife I said hello. Will do. Okay, thank bye. you.